Let's get started. Welcome, everyone. The title of the lecture today is um, The Internet Treats Censorship as a Malfunction and Roots Around It. Uh, it's a quotation by a co-founder of the quite well-known digital rights adv advocacy group in the U.S., the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, a quotation by, attributed to um, Dan Gilmore. Um, <clears throat> I've put a question mark after it um, to emphasize um, the change that has taken place between when it was said, which is in the early 90s, um, uh, until now. And what I would like to emphasize uh, when talking about this, this qu quotation is not only um, how quickly and dynamically the internet evolves, um, but also um, the, the, per the, the particular ideas people had about the internet, where they actually came from, are quite different from the sorts of ideas we have now. So, so the, the idea that the internet would treat censorship as a malfunction and root around it comes from two sort of kind of, let's say, hardware principles built into the, into the internet or built into the, the uh, initial infrastructure or the, the, the protocols of the internet. One is um, uh, so-called packet switching, <coughs> whereby, um, and here come all the different metaphors, whereby when you send, for example, an email message, or when you send uh, data, um, it would, it, the data would, would root it themselves around the internet, finding uh, efficient pathways or uh, avoiding blockages. Um, the second one is the end-to-end -end principle. Um, the end-to-end -end principle is important um, because um, the internet supposedly will transport content no matter uh, how offensive or uh, political or no matter, th will transport content no matter what the content is, um, like a telephone conversation. Uh, so the internet was sort of based on these two principles and, and that is why, it's, at least in the early days, it was thought that uh, you could not censor the internet, that, that one, uh, when one is online, um, one couldn't be censored and then therefore it would be disruptive um, to, to, uh, to, to current politics, to certain political systems, to oppressive regimes, etc. It was considered a, a disruptive technology in that, in that particular sense. To illustrate that, I, I put up a quotation by quite a well-known law professor from Duke University uh, called James Boyle, uh, who talks uh, in more detail of what I just, what I just mentioned, um, where the idea is because of the way the internet is set up, um, messages are going to get through despite attempts to block them. Uh, and it's because of the architecture. Uh, it's because of the uh, the end-to-end -end principle and also because of uh, packet switching. And what I like here um, is how Boyle, in some sense, grants agency uh, to content online, saying that it seeks out, seeks out uh, alternative routes if it's going to be blocked. So the also, the internet had projected upon it by any number of different advocates um, and analysts um, particular ideas about its yeah it's kind of in how it would empower uh, users and and, uh, and, and disrupt uh, contemporary politics. Now, I want to fast forward um, to uh, 2011 or 2012. Um, also, what I had on screen just prior to starting. Uh, and a quotation by the Open Net Initiative. The Open Net Initiative are the leading internet censorship scholars in the world. It's a collaboration between the Berkman Center at Harvard University uh, and principally uh, the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto um, <coughs> together with uh, a company called the SecDev Group. Um, and uh, the Open Net Initiative um, monitors 40 plus countries for incidents of uh, s state internet censorship, 40 plus countries. Uh, so, so you have a sense immediately of how um, the internet, uh, and in particular the web, uh, has changed over the last uh, 20, 25 years. 
from an, an architecture uh, where censorship would be circumvented or would, would in fact, would hardly take place to, um, to a situation where it takes place routinely. And that is the subject for, for, for this week, Internet censorship and, and how to study it. Now, one could study it according to what I've just put forward to you, certain claims and certain cl counterclaims plus the empirical evidence. Um, and uh, we're going to also get into Internet censorship and, in fact, study contemporary claims and do empirical work to see whether or not um, these claims uh, still hold. Um, so I want to get started by uh, pointing out that quite some skill uh, is involved in actually doing internet censorship uh, research. Um, in some sense, you could say that sites are either blocked or they're not blocked in particular countries. And when you say that, it seems straightforward. Um, but there's a lot more to it. There are at least three or four elements that, that, that one needs to concentrate on. Um, and the first one is to build a list of websites and potentially keywords, but in particular websites, um, to check for, for blocking. Um, so, so this is a skill in and of itself. So how do you build a list? So we're going to spend a little bit of time on um, URL list building and, and li or list building in general, sort of new media style. So how do you, how do you make, build a list? It's a sort of fundamental skill. Uh, and, and I'm going to go through um, five uh, techniques in order to build a list, and some build on, uh, on, on, the, on another technique. Some, <coughs> some are multiple uh, techniques. Um, that's the first thing. But then the, the second thing is, is then once you have a list um, to check for uh, blockage um, and how to do that. So in particular in the workshop, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about it, um, one... Um, uses a variety of techniques to check for blockage. Um, in the class, we'll use a piece of software that we developed here called the Internet Censorship Explorer, uh, which uses uh, proxies, uh, and now most recently also VPNs uh, to check, to, to, in some sense, surf, which is an old term, or to visit websites uh, from uh, the particular countries in question, and s remotely. So we'll use proxies as well as VPNs to visit our newly made lists of websites from uh, machines in the, uh, the countries of in question, the countries under study. Uh, then the third element um, is not only list building and, and actually visiting these websites f using techniques uh, from the particular countries in question, but also thinking about um, the sort of both the geography as well as the time frame of, of, uh, of checking for blockages. Uh, so, so spatial and, and temporal uh, considerations. So not all sites are blocked all the time and not all sites are blocked from the same locations in, within a particular country. Sometimes more websites are blocked more frequently from capital cities, for example, uh, and during times of unrest or demonstration or uh, anniversaries of major events. Uh, so this is the third element that one needs to take into consideration. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I come to the case studies. So let me, uh, let me begin with um, general approaches to, to building URL lists. Or these are, in fact, general approaches to building lists, um, uh, yeah, sort of in general. So, so the first one, and this is the, the most um, let's say popular one or the one, one that's most well known is, an, is, is, is the editorial technique. Now the editorial technique um, is one whereby you in some sense play the role of a collection maker or a curator or a um, I don't know, specimen collector where you put together uh, a list of, of, of URLs, a list of websites according to your particular criteria. Um, and there are good lists and there are not so good lists. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes, what makes a good list from an editorial 
uh, perspective. Uh, the second um, type is uh, crowdsourcing. Um, crowdsourcing is to invert the editorial task and, and in some sense outsource it, give it to the crowd, uh, give it to others um, to either fill in online forms or otherwise um, source from a crowd, for example, this, this classroom, um, a set of websites. And there is um, uh, less, like, like a, yeah, there's sort of, the, the expertise is then also, in some sense, outsourced. Um, so, so this is a technique which, which um, has particular reasons to be implemented. So it's when you yourself, for example, don't have the expertise, or you and your colleagues don't have the expertise, or you can't find the expertise um, to, to build a list. So you might want to outsource it. The third one um, is what I call search engine work. And one can sort of type queries into search engine and receive returns and make a list from the returns you receive. Um, and, or, you can think about how to query the engine. Um, from techniques that we've learned previously, query design techniques, whereby you ask the engine to output a very specific uh, set of URLs, and then you use those URLs subsequently uh, for your list. Um, the fourth one um, is what I have called uh, device studies. And device studies is, a, is a, quite a general term which um, relies on a variety of online machines, devices, techniques in existence for, uh, for URLs. Um, so <clears throat> if, for example, you were interested in studying um, the blogosphere in uh, a particular country, um, you might want to use a blog uh, engine or a blog directory from that particular country. So. I'll give you some examples of that. Or if you wanted to study um, the most popular URLs in a particular country, uh, then you might want to use a device that claims to output um, the most popular URLs in a particular country. Um, for example, you might want to use the service called Alexa, uh, which has lists, top 500 lists uh, per country uh, of, of top uh, URLs per country, according to um, a number of things, including those users who have installed the Alexa toolbar and who have indicated by filling out the postal code field uh, when registering the software um, that they live in a particular place. So, so these are users from a particular place um, who are visiting URLs, and then all those users from particular places visiting URLs are then aggregated, and then a a list of most popular URLs per place is created. So this is, Alexa is, is, is one uh, device where one would do device studies, um, and there are many others. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. <coughs> Finally, um, we've introduced a technique here uh, which we refer to as dynamic URL sampling. So you have made a list um, by whichever means um, um, that we've talked about previously, and you take that list of URLs and you enter it into a piece of software that crawls those URLs and finds related URLs on the basis of hyperlink uh, behavior, so on the basis of hyperlinking. Um, and this is the issue crawler software which we've developed here, uh, which takes as its inputs a set of URLs. Um, it crawls those URLs and finds those other URLs that are linked to by uh, your uh, seed set. Uh, in two ty different types of analyses, one a co-link analysis and the other one a so snowball analysis. For the purposes of, of dynamic URL sampling, I would uh, recommend that you use the co-link um, uh, analysis. You should make a note of that. Use the co-link analysis uh, module. Uh, enter a list of URLs, um, and then it finds those URLs that at least two of your seed URLs have linked to. So this gives you more relevant URLs according to your seeds. Um, and it's their up-to-date URLs. Um, that's why we call it dynamic URL sampling because it's it's on the basis of your um, uh, the list that you've just made. Um, so those are the <coughs> those are the techniques, and I'd like to go through them um, in in a little bit of detail 
Um, so you can so you can think uh, think about them uh, along with me. So the the first one is the editorial list. Now, <coughs> it was um, up until very recently, um, it was uh, quite um, conventional to rely on two leading um, uh, web directories. Uh, one is Yahoo, uh, and the other is DMOS, which uh, has been the open source alternative um, to uh, to Yahoo. Uh, now it was announced, I think, about three months ago, that Yahoo is going to discontinue its its sort of world famous directory. Yahoo is, in fact, in some sense, the first, well, one of the first, or at least the well, most well known first uh, search engine, um, and and and. Search engine should be in, uh, in quotation marks in the sense that it was a directory. So a, a sort of handmade uh, listing of websites categorized. So if you needed a list of human rights websites, um, you would go to Yahoo and, and type in human rights. That's what your search would be. And then you would get a, a list of, of websites which had been um, curated and, and vetted by uh, people working at Yahoo. So they would curate and, and, and vet lists uh, of, of URLs by category. Same with DMOS, but that, that was sort of crowdsourced or uh, something in between. Um, so there, w there would be editors and then, and then individuals uh, would uh, contribute URLs and then editors would check them. Um, now both of these are or have been for some time severely in decline. So uh, it's important to think about where are the current lists? Now, um, there are any number of different organizations uh, which maintain lists of URLs um, and um, that are then generic. Um, so, uh, for example, Choika, uh, which is a, a, a point, that which is, it's, it's, you spell that C-H-O-I-K-E, which is a global south civil society portal, um, for some time, uh, keeps lists of, for example, human rights organizations based in the Global South. Uh, and, th and these were, um, for some time, until very, very recently, kept up to date. Um, the UN uh, does keep up to date lists of, of different sorts of uh, organizations that have an, a kind of an affiliation of some, in some ways with the UN. So these are, are, are accredited or vetted organizations. So if you would like a, a list of NGOs working in a particular area, the UN has uh, these such lists. And then these are sort of vetted lists. Um, so it gives them an extra standing. Um, now, um, this is one type where you, where you rely on a directory or a, an, an authoritative source that works like a directory, but per subject area. That's one way to sort of rely on, on, uh, on already edited uh, lists. Um, another way is to learn, in some sense, from um, those organizations who track um, spam or sites that could be uh, considered sensitive. Um, so um, Cyber Nanny, Cyber Patrol, um, there's a bunch of them, um, Squid Guard, um, Surf Control, uh, etc. These are, these are, these are um, <coughs> list builders that are building lists for di very, very different purposes. They're building lists that, that um, various, um, uh, that where, where, whether it's companies or other um, uh, individuals, uh, parents, uh, or even in some cases uh, states, which want to have a list of, let's say, alcohol-related websites. Um, and those websites, the uh, list of those websites are made so that, you know, kids or, uh, or those in uh, uh, living in Muslim countries do, are not able to surf uh, alcohol-related websites, for example. So, so these are, and these are all all commercial. <coughs> so they tend to be they tend to be uh, uh, very much up to date. Um, the third um, is Wikipedia, and Wikipedia is one of the most, I guess, sort of up-to-date and ever-evolving uh, sources for lists of all kinds. Um, and it tends to be exhaustive to the point where um, um, it, is, it is so complete that, that it, 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 
you know, it loses its kind of, um, it loses the, the, uh, a sense of, of vettedness. Uh, so it, it loses, it, it loses um, an idea of what's more important than, than other things. Uh, so that's, but on the other hand, um, because of its completeness, um, it's, it's, it's useful if you want to research everything, uh, so to speak. Um, but not only is it good for list of URLs, it's also very, very good for keywords. So um, a lot of projects have used uh, the names of the articles in Wikipedia as keywords uh, for uh, searches, especially uh, to research uh, Chinese uh, internet censorship. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the, the final one, and this was a, a tip uh, from, from Eric Bora, um, is to use uh, the transparency reports of the major um, platforms. So Google, um, Twitter, and Facebook uh, in their efforts to uh, be even more transparent, I mean, most of these were already set up, and Yahoo has one as well. Most of these that were, were set up before um, Ed, uh, Edward Snowden uh, revealed <coughs> the workings of the NSA, um, but now they've been augmented since then where companies are wanting to show even more um, uh, transparently the requests that, that they get from various states uh, to either take down content or, or, or otherwise act. Um, and when I went through this material, especially Google, um, but also the others, were, were really interesting to, so you can learn what I refer to here as state sensitivities. So per country, the, oftentimes these are lists per country, you can see the types of uh, sites, so the types of content um, that each country asks Google and others um, to take down. So then you can, you can begin to understand what, what states uh, are sensitive about. Um, and therefore, on that basis, think about building um, your, think about a project, first of all. So on, so on the basis of certain sen state sensitivities um, you, f that you gain from, from those the transparency reports, then subsequently you, you build your lists. <coughs> Some examples. Um, this is um, a, 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 the categories uh, that the Open Net Initiative has been using in order to study um, uh, internet censorship all over the world. So they have a series of categories, and these categories have been, have been updated and, and actually shrunk. Uh, if you go to OpenNet.net uh, and you click on uh, the world map, uh, you'll see that they highlight now uh, just five categories. Uh, but they have more, uh, and, and they um, build lists per category and then query those lists per category in a series of countries and thereby are able to do comparative research. Yeah, so in this state, this particular category has a higher incidence of blockage, whereas in this state, another category does. So, so building categories en enables you to do uh, comparative research. This is an example of uh, one of their maps uh, which shows um, the incidence of, uh, of internet state censorship uh, per country and then the, the, the redder the color, um, the more comprehensive uh, the censorship is and, and also the greater number of categories that are being censored. Um, just as a, another example, um, this is a category list uh, that was made um, by one of the kind of what I've referred to previously as the black list builders or the, those commercial or non-commercial uh, firms uh, or organizations that build lists of websites for the, for the purposes of um, using, of having either um, a sort of filtering software, build, build them into filtering software, have them used uh, by parents, etc. Um, so there are a number of these lists, lists out there. Um, you'll notice that some are better than others um, uh, on the basis of the extent to which they're used. Um, that's one. Uh, and also the extent to which they come from a reputable, from reputable sources. Um, the, the sort of web security industry <coughs> is dynamic. Um, 
there, there are, it's also consolidated over the past uh, three or four years uh, where there are something like three or four, um, five uh, leading firms in the area and, and only one or two of them make, make their lists or some of the lists available. Um, so, uh, but the, they are dynamic, so uh, you'll have to check which ones are available. Um, this one is an interesting uh, project um, blocked on Weibo. Um, now, I mentioned previously that uh, Wikipedia is often used as a source, uh, is often used for th things other than as an encyclopedia. And Wikipedia is used in this particular project as a source for keywords. So all of the article names in the uh, Mandarin uh, Wikipedia uh, uh, were extracted and then fed through um, the, so the social media service in, in China were able to see which keywords were blocked uh, and, and, that, and, uh, and, and there was a list made um, of blocked keywords on the basis of extracting those from Wikipedia and, filter and, 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 and uh, running them through uh, Weibo. So, so this, is a, this is a concrete example of how Wikipedia is used um, as, a, as, a, as a source for keywords to study internet uh, censorship. Okay, <clears throat> this is the second technique. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's crowdsourcing um, in order to build lists. Now, um, just I want to preface this really briefly by talking a little bit about, about crowdsourcing generally. So, so crowdsourcing um, is, a, is a technique that is often used for, let's say, cheap or free labor. Um, and, and thereby is part of the, this larger kind of uh, new digital economy. Um, some call it a sort of the new sweatshop economy. Um, uh, and it is, uh, in some sense, um, one that has been critiqued, but also one that's been studied uh, for the question of the quality of the results. So how good um, um, are the results from, from crowdsourcing? And, and could the crowd indeed have, have, have wisdom, as the, as the expression wisdom of the crowd goes? Um, so this is, the, this is how it's been studied. Um, it can also be put to use. Um, so some of the services um, that, are, that are quite famous, Mechanical Turk, and, and all the other ones like Mechanical Turk, where um, you uh, have you put up a job and you have uh, people um, bid on it um, and and you outsource a particular job to the crowd um, that's one way that 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 crowdsourcing is, is well one means that crowdsourcing is, is known by another one that's a, probably a, a lot closer to <coughs> to our world <coughs> is the recapture um, uh, security code. So oftentimes when, when you type in something, if you over search Google, for example, and Google thinks you're a robot, um, which you may have experienced, you get a, you get a captcha um, and you type in uh, letters or numbers. So, so a lot of um, um, companies and, and systems use what's called recaptcha. And this was um, developed by Car Carnegie Mellon uh, University in, in Pittsburgh. And recapture um, uses these people filling in these security codes um, to turn uh, uh, scanned uh, digital material into machine-readable material. Um, so you are, in fact, when you type in these uh, security codes, you're helping digital libraries, so to speak, turn their scanned materials into machine-readable materials. And when they're machine-readable, they're therefore searchable. Um, so those are the sort of mo more well-known general um, applications of, 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 of crowdsourcing. And, and, and it's been put to use in, uh, in many different sorts of research endeavors, including internet censorship. And um, uh, there are a couple of uh, examples. I think the most well-known one um, is Herdict, um, <clears throat> which, which I think is short for the verdict of the herd. Um, which is uh, which is a project by the Berkman Center at Harvard, also in some sense a part of the uh, OpenNet initiative. 
Um, and this asks users um, to um, insert URLs um, and, um, and uh, through or first it asks users to install an add-on in Firefox um, and give your location. And then when, you're, when, you're, when you encounter a blocked website, um, you are able to report that URL um, to the central service called Herdix. And so then the crowd visiting uh, websites are, are able together um, to make a much larger report of what is blocked than individual researchers could do. Um, <clears throat> so that's an example. Another one, um, this is an uh, historical one. This was a project that has now been revamped. It's called the Great Firewall of China. Um, dot org. And, and the Great Firewall of China, what it uh, did was have users um, insert URLs <coughs> and it was, and then if, and then they would be put through proxies in China and if they were blocked, um, then it was stored with the time and the URL and the date and, um, and then it would slowly build this sort of great wall. Uh, this was the, this was the sort of uh, aesthetic uh, concept. Um, this is a different project uh, which uh, also um, uh, crowdsources URLs. It does more than that, uh, but it's called greatfire.org. Crowdsources URLs um, and, uh, and thereby gives you a sort of up-to-date status of, um, of uh, the types of URLs uh, and, in fact, which URLs in particular are, are, are blocked in, uh, in, in, in China. It, it does other things as well. It does also device studies, uh, which I'll come back to in a, in a minute. Um, this is the Herdict uh, project, as I mentioned before. Um, so you can, um, uh, you can become a user of this in two ways. You can become a supplier, so you, you download your Firefox extension. You, you type in um, where you are uh, and where you're surfing from, um, and then you can report URLs, uh, or and or um, you can um, type in an individual URL and find out the, the status of it um, per country, so whether or not it, whether it's a blocked or not. Yeah, finally, <clears throat> in terms of crowdsourcing, I want to mention a, 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 a very important project uh, that's being run out of the Berkeley, out of, out of Berkeley, uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley. And, and, and this is the China Digital Times. And the China Digital Times um, crowdsources a bunch of different things. Um, but one of them is, are URLs, um, and these are, um, uh, but, but more importantly, they crowdsource sensitive keywords. Now, this is a sort of quite a famous story uh, that in, I think it was 2011, 2012, um, someone used the term in Chinese, uh, grass mud horse, uh, which in Mandarin sounds very much like, and I'm not going to say it in English because it's a, it's a swear word, but it, uh, it sounds like so the native speakers help the non-native speakers. It's, it's F your M. <laughs> so the native speakers can help the non-native speakers uh, during the break, uh, what that means. But it sounds literally like that um, in Chinese, grass, mud, horse. And what it, what it basically uh, launched was uh, an entire movement of using terms uh, in Chinese that are just slightly different from uh, uh, the original terms, and then creating a huge dictionary or lexicon of them, and that's what um, that's what the China Digital Times has been doing. They've been collecting these terms from uh, from uh, from users all over the world, um, and also then subsequently uh, seeing the extent to which uh, they are effective in circumventing internet censorship. Um, so, so whilst the original terms that they're similar to may be blocked. The question is, are also um, the, the new gray grass mud horse terms also uh, being blocked or not? And this, is, this leads to questions, of course, of the general effectiveness of, of internet censorship per country, uh, and in particular in China. Uh, and we'll come to that uh, also in a minute. 
Yeah, I want to just mention um, China just a little bit more to talk about the amount of a lot of internet censorship research, um, but also a lot of internet censorship awareness projects focus on, on China. Um, now, it's been in the news uh, quite a lot. Um, and in particular, um, it was in the news some years ago uh, when um, it was learned that uh, not only Google, but also uh, Microsoft and its search engine, Yahoo as well, were um, complying with um, Chinese uh, law and regulations, <coughs> but thereby also um, impinging on sort of um, uh, certain American values, uh, freedom of speech, etc., cetera, um, where these three companies came under fire, uh, in particular in the US, and they all had to appear before um, the, the uh, US Congress and explain why it is um, that, they are, um, that they are censoring content in China as well as also giving up the names of particular users. Uh, Yahoo and, and, and Microsoft uh, were accused of that um, and it was demonstrated that they did do that um, to the Chinese authorities. So why, why was it? And so whilst this was going on, uh, there were a lot of uh, stories in the, in the news and the media about um, uh, Chinese internet censorship. And, and one of the uh, awareness projects that was uh, uh, done, and I showed you this previously, uh, was by the Open Net Initiative, where they, they had put up side by side the results of um, uh, Google China and, and Google.com. Um, subsequently, uh, what happened was, was that Google decided to uh, move out of uh, the Chinese market or move their search engine to Hong Kong, which is still, of course, China, uh, but has slightly more liberal uh, regulations. Um, and, and this was, in some sense, um, not only a reaction to um, um, all of this, all the public scrutiny of, of Google, but also, in, in a way, a, a kind of public relations uh, coup for, for, uh, for Google, um, saying, um, that we, uh, we indeed don't do uh, any evil. Um, another awareness project um, was the China Channel uh, Firefox add-on, um, no longer current but still worth mentioning uh, in, the, in the kind of history of, of awareness projects. This is, um, this is one, you can still find it, uh, and, and you can still install it, um, but you'll then have to sort of install a kind of retrograde, uh, a retro installation, a retro, uh, installation of, of Firefox if you want to use it. Um, but what this does is it gives you the experience of visiting websites or surfing in China. So, so it loads everything in your, so basically uh, give, you know, automatically puts a proxy, a Chinese proxy, um, on in your in Firefox and, and uh, then it gives you the, basically the experience of websites loading uh, in China and so what you often see in in uh, China if you if you load a, a website that's been banned um, is you don't get a forbidden um, uh, page or but y your connection just gets timed out um, and it, as if it's not working so it's 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 important that you know that when you do uh, Internet censorship research in China, that, that that's one of the particular techniques that, are, that is used. Yeah, here's another one. <clears throat> this is, um, this then moves a little bit uh, further in the direction of thinking about uh, internet censorship as n not only as country based, uh, but as, um, as, as regional, for example. So, so this particular project, again, an awareness raising project, but then also raising a, se a second level of awareness uh, in, to the extent, or complicating internet censorship to the extent that a particular, particular websites could be blocked in certain regions of China and in other regions they're, they're not blocked. Or they can be blocked by certain ISPs uh, and not other ISPs. Uh, so this is, um, this is how one would study this different IP range, different IP addresses. Okay, um, the third um, technique to build lists um, is, uh, is what I call search engine work. Now, search engine work 
um, is something that you'll now be familiar with uh, and query design. So if you're thinking about how do I build a list of websites um, in, from a particular country um, now, and I, and I could use it, and I want to use a search engine to do so. Um, well, then you would formulate um, your query with, with the uh, operator uh, site, site colon, um, and you could use the, uh, the country domain, the top level country domain name. In this case, it's Portugal. Um, and query, and then you get, you get a list of, so Google then will provide you a list with, with dot PTs. Um, so Portuguese websites. Now, if you want to then subsequently query Google for um, second level um, country domains, right? so then not .uk but .co.uk or .ac.uk or .org.uk, then you can build longer lists. So you can build lists of first of just .co.uk's and then you can build a list of universities, build a list, etc. So in order to do this, you look up, and, and Wikipedia, of course, is a source for this, but also <coughs> um, um, other sort of, there are different lists, there are different places where you can find lists of second level country domains. Uh, for example, um, I think it's the Norwegian uh, Internet Registrar um, has one of the most, Norred, I think it's called, has one of the most comprehensive lists of, of uh, top and second level, uh, particular second level country domains. So all the co.uk's. Now the Netherlands, of course, only has .nl, um, and, and Germany only has .de, but France, for example, has a, has a wide range of, uh, of second level country domains. Um, now, I mentioned France, whilst it has a wide range, certain, certain of these are not very used. Um, so one should also familiarize oneself um, with the use culture of these second level uh, domains. Um, yes, yeah, so some, some, aren't, some aren't routinely used, but then others, then others are. Um, now, <clears throat> I mentioned previously, if you would like to uh, research particular subject matters, uh, particular sensitive subjects per country, uh, and you want to query, for example, uh, you can query uh, the country domain and then um, a keyword. Um, there's a difference between querying them uh, w uh, without quotation marks and, and with quotation marks. Um, for internet censorship research, you might want to query without. Now, I know this is different from uh, uh, the work that we were doing uh, last week when you want to see which sites specifically use particular words. Uh, <coughs> here you want, might want to see which use equivalents, uh, because if uh, if um, certain a certain web if you if you're going to use a term if you know that you're going to be censored for a particular term you might want to use different terms that are considered to be similar uh, or or uh, or equivalents by by Google, um, so you might want to use the <coughs> without quotation marks. Okay, the fourth um, technique for building lists uh, is something that I, I call device studies. Now, um, device studies is basically outsourcing the work of building the list to an online device. And by online devices, there are a bunch of them. Um, now, we've talked about search engines, um, and previously I also mentioned Alexa. So if you go to alexa.com, and there are two tabs at the top, uh, or at least two, and one says uh, top URLs per country. You click on that. You can get um, the top 500 URLs per country according to, uh, according to Alexa. Now, this can be useful in your strategy of, of list building and also in your research questions um, because you can find out whether or not top sites in a particular country are, are blocked and thereby also get an indication of the level of uh, internet a censorship um, circumvention, for example. Um, the third kind of device um, are advertisers' tools. Um, if you use, for example, um, Google Display Pla uh, Planner or uh, AdWords or others, uh, but also, also um, uh, advertising tools, 
by, by other companies, they'll give you um, URL lists, uh, the, sort of the top URLs um, per country um, or per language. Um, so you can also be interested in, to, uh, as advertisers will want to advertise in a particular language, advertising tools or advertisers tools uh, provide also lists of URLs per language. Um, so these are these can be useful now. It's a different kind of list. It's it's those it's 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 lists of URLs that are attractive to advertisers. Um, so so you won't get too many human rights organizations, for example, in those those kind of lists. Yeah. So it's a very very different way of uh, of building a list. Um, yeah. Blog aggregators. Uh, it's interesting. Um, uh, Google <coughs> Blog Search has been has has been uh, deprecated as of May, I think, um, 2014. So one of the, in some sense, sort of authors of lists of blogs uh, is, is, now, is now gone. Um, but uh, any number of other lists uh, or list makers remain. Um, in certain countries, bloggers are very influential. Um, they're considered to be important authors or important writers, important voices in, in particular countries. And in any number of these countries, there will also be lists of top bloggers. Um, so you can rely on services that provide lists of, of blogs. Um, one example is, is Iran, and this, and this study um, that we did on, uh, on national web studies um, uh, in Iran uh, uses any number of lists of, uh, of blogs um, and relies on them for an indication of, of what is the blogosphere and then thereby how blocked or how censored is the blogosphere in a particular country or in Iran. Um, social media. Yeah, so, so, so lists of top URLs according to any kind of, of social, uh, social media. So, so per country there are often um, or um, yeah, per country or also more globally, there are, there are any number of uh, lists of URLs that have been uh, inputted by users, ranked or rated as good, um, and thereby um, worthy of reading. So you can think of Reddit or you can think of these sorts of services sort of more globally, or then per country. Um, so those, those services that, that pe where people input significant URLs and users rate them and then there are lists of them. So these are also top URLs per country or per subject matter um, that have been in some sense vetted by the crowd. So you can use these lists. Now I mentioned previously this project uh, greatfire.org um, so it, it aggregates um, any number of lists using also device studies. Um, so you see here at the top, um, the 995 or out of the top thousand Alexa URLs for China. Uh, so they're monitoring which of those thousand URLs are, are blocked in, in China, um, etc. Yeah, so, so they use different devices. Weibo they use, Wikipedia they use. Um, yeah, so they use these, these various devices in order to source, source URLs. Okay, so here's Alexa. Um, so they have per country, they have a list of countries, and then per country um, they have the top sites. So here are the top sites uh, in Russia, um, because a couple of year, about a year ago, according to Alexa. Um, what's interesting about Alexa, and, w and this, is, this is quite fun, is you can see in which other countries um, um, it's a uh, particular sites or a top site. Um, and in what other countries these particular websites are less relevant. So you can see different constant geographical concentrations of, of, of relevant websites. Um, this is the this is a list of, um, of top websites in Iran. Now, in 2009, during the Iran election crisis, um, I happened to be in Armenia, which borders Iran. 
Um, and we were hearing all, I was with those, with a group of students like yourselves, and we heard a, a number of press reports that uh, during the Iran election crisis, a number of websites were being blocked. Um, so what I had uh, a group of, uh, of uh, media researchers do on site right then was to undertake a, a research project to look into the claims that were made in the news about blocked websites in, in Iran. Um, so how did we do that? So how would one begin such a project? Um, so to make it relatively straightforward, uh, what I uh, decided to do was, was say, okay, we're going to take the top websites according to uh, visits in, um, in Iran and thereby according to Alexa. Um, and we're going to uh, put them through the Internet uh, uh, Censorship Explorer and very carefully save all the results, etc., cetera, um, and very carefully determine uh, the extent to which the, the top websites in Iran, according to Alexa, are, are, uh, are blocked. So we, did the, we spent two days uh, doing that, and we put out a press release um, saying what, what we found. And this was picked up. Uh, this <laughs> sort of appeared in, in any number of regional uh, um, and, uh, and international uh, news uh, sources, uh, what we had found. Um, to be the case. And, and we, found th we found things that were slightly counterintuitive. We found things that were a little bit different from what was in the, in the mainstream media. Um, and uh, and we, had, we had sort of claims to, to do it quite carefully. We also took screenshots, et cetera. We had a, a number of amount of documentation so, so people could follow up on these findings. Yeah, this is... Um, this is from the Google Ad Planner. This is a, a means to source uh, URLs by category um, as an example. Okay, so that was device studies. This is the last one. Um, uh, it's dynamic URL sampling. Now, <clears throat> what one does here is you take your list of URLs that you have from another technique, that you have obtained from another technique, and then you enter them into the issue crawler. Now. Um, you'll have to have a rec an account from the issue crawler, um, so you have to re request an account. It's free. Um, and one of the things that you need to do when you request an account is, is put down your institutional affiliation, so write University of Amsterdam, then you'll get the account a lot faster. Um, and you, you take your list of URLs and you enter it into the issue crawler and you perform co-link analysis. Uh, and that's one of your options, co-link analysis. Um, and what you then get is a, uh, a map uh, as well as a list. So you get your output a, or a graph, a cluster graph, um, as well as a list of URLs. And then this longer list uh, you can use as an input into the Internet Censorship Explorer. Now, I'm going to um, take you through uh, a couple of examples of using dynamic URL sampling um, in a minute. Uh, but first, I just want to briefly summarize the, the five uh, techniques and say another word or two about them. So the editorial approach is um, one that's, that's used the most, uh, but it's also in some sense the most difficult because you um, need to make uh, a decision between um, how exhaustive you would like your list to be versus how much your list should relate to a particular research question. Um, and if you want to uh, study uh, human rights uh, websites, for example, and the extent to which they're blocked in a particular country, um, you could spend um, you know, a, quite a long time creating an exhaustive list, or you could rely on other expertly authored lists of human rights organizations, such as those by the UN, which will give you a shorter list, which is more manageable, and which has been previously vetted, and which has the top ones, the top human rights NGOs. Um, so you have, to have a, you have to weigh the trade-off between exhaustiveness on the one hand, and in some sense, doability, um, and, and, the, and vetted, curated, top um, uh, uh, URL lists on the other hand. Yeah? So that's one, one important consideration. Um, when when um, crowdsourcing, now crowdsourcing is something I guess that, that we won't do ourselves, um, but we can rely on those other, those other projects which have crowdsourced. Um, 
Now, one consideration to, to think about when relying on crowdsourced URLs um, is, the is the extent of the liveliness of the project. A lot of projects that try to crowdsource um, are left with uh, a lot of blank fields in their database because people don't use the service. So crowdsourcing offered, often suffers from um, a lack of crowd, basically, or the laziness um, of, of the crowd. So different, different elements of the crowd. Not the wisdom of the crowd, but other elements or other characteristics of the crowd. Um, so it's important that the projects have been active. Um, search engine work, which we've talked about, uh, remember that it is important to formulate a good query um, to think about your query design because uh, you will get much better lists and you'll have much better arguments about where your lists have come from uh, if you uh, talk about your query design in detail as opposed to, say, to saying, I used Google to make a list. Okay, uh, good, uh, but th 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 that's... No, that, that paper won't be published, whereas the one that describes, in particular, the query um, uh, could be. Uh, device studies. Device studies is, is a kind of, um, often used as a, as a kind of triangulation technique. So I'm going to source um, URLs from a number of different meta sources or aggregators and then put together this larger collection. And therefore, I believe I have I have better coverage. <coughs> now, as anyone will ever tell you, your, um, you the, the, um, a triangulated set of lists is only good as each of the individual lists that have been uh, inputted in, into the triangulation process. Um, so um, when relying on device studies, you want to have good devices. Um, so it's better to use two um, good ones than, than, than five where three are quite uh, of poor quality. Um, and finally, the dynamic URL sampling, uh, what I would like to mention is, is when you crawl uh, an existing list of your URLs to find more URLs that are relevant to the existing list, first of all, the existing list needs to be good. Um, if it's not very good, then crawling them and getting more URLs won't help your original list, number one. Number two, when you crawl <coughs> and you get, an, you get a, 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 an additional list, an extended list to your, to your original one, um, you should again check those URLs to make sure that they're all relevant. So you might get two or three or four uh, which aren't relevant uh, from your crawl result. So check again and remove those irrelevant URLs. Okay, so that's um, list building. Uh, let's take a break. We'll see each other in 15 minutes. <laughs>